Chapter 10 of True Stories of Crime from the District Attorney's Office by Arthur Cheney Train. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. A Flight into Texas. The flight and extradition of Charles F. Dodge unquestionably involved one of the most extraordinary battles with justice in the history of the criminal law. The funds at the disposal of those who were interested in procuring the prisoner's escape were unlimited in extent, and the arch-conspirator, for whose safety Dodge was spirited away, was so influential in political and criminal circles that he was all but successful in defying the prosecutor of New York County, even supported as the latter was by the military and judicial arm of the United States government. For at the time that Dodge made his escape, a whisper from Hummel was enough to make the dry bones of many a powerful and ostensibly respectable official rattle, and the tongue cleave to the roof of his mouth in terror. Who could accomplish that in which the law was powerless? Hummel. Who could drive to the uttermost ends of the earth persons against whom not a shadow of suspicion had previously rested? Hummel. Who dictated to the chiefs of police of foreign cities what they should or should not do in certain cases, and who could, at the beckoning of his little finger, summon to his dungeon-like offices in the New York Life Building, whither his firm had removed from Center Street, the most prominent of lawyers, the most eminent of citizens? Surely none but Hummel. And now Hummel was fighting for his own life. The only man that stood between him and the iron bars of Blackwell's Island was Charles F. Dodge, the man whom he had patted on the knee in his office and called a mascot, when quite in the nature of business he needed a little perjury to assist a wealthy client. Hummel in terror called into play every resource upon which, during forty years of practice, his tiny tentacles had fastened. Who shall say that while he made a show of enjoying himself nightly with his accustomed light-heartedness in the tenderloin, he did not feel confident that in the end this peril would disappear like the others which had from time to time threatened him during his criminal career. But Hummel was fully aware of the tenacity of the man who had resolved to rid New York of his malign influence. His nemesis was following him. In his dreams, if he ever dreamed, it probably took the shape of the square-shouldered district attorney, in the shadow of whose office building the little shyster practiced his profession. Had he been told that this nemesis was in reality a jovial little man with a round, ruddy face and twinkling blue eyes, he would have laughed as heartily as it was in his power to laugh. Yet such was the fact. A little man who looked less like a detective than a commercial traveler selling St. Peter's oil or some other cheerful concoction, with manners as gentle and a voice as soft as a spring zephyr, who always took off his hat when he came into a business office, seemingly bashful to the point of self-effacement, was the one who snatched Charles F. Dodge from the borders of Mexico and held him in an iron grip when every influence upon which Hummel could call for aid from crooked police officials, corrupt judges, and a gang of cutthroats under the guise of a sheriff's posse were fighting for his release. Jesse Blocker is not employed in New York County, and for business reasons he does not wish his present address known. When he comes to New York, he occasionally drops into the writer's office for a cigar and a friendly chat about old times. And as he sits there and talks so modestly and with such quiet humor about his adventures with the Texas Rangers among the cactus-studded plains of the Lone Star State, it is hard even for one who knows the truth to realize that this man is one of the greatest of detectives, or rather one of the most capable, resourceful, adroit, and quick-witted knights of adventure who ever set forth upon a seemingly impossible errand. It is unnecessary to state just how the district attorney discovered the existence of Jesse, as we knew him. It is enough to say that on Saturday morning, July 23, 1904, he was furnished with the proper credentials and given instructions to proceed at once to New Orleans, Louisiana, and locate, if it were humanly possible to do so, Charles F. Dodge, under indictment for perjury and potentially the chief witness against Abraham H. Hummel on a charge of conspiracy. He was told briefly and to the point that, in spite of the official reports from the police headquarters of both New York City and New Orleans to the contrary, there was reason to believe that Dodge was living, although not registered, as a guest at the St. Charles Hotel in the latter city. A partial and inaccurate description of Dodge was given him, 
and he was warned to use extreme caution to prevent any knowledge of his mission from being made known. Once Dodge had been discovered, he was to keep him under surveillance and wire New York immediately. Accordingly, Jesse left the city upon the same day at 4.45 p.m., and arrived two days later at 9.15 on Monday morning at New Orleans, where he went directly to the St. Charles Hotel, registered, and was assigned to room number 547 on the fifth floor. Somewhere in the hotel, Dodge was secreted. The question was how to find him. For an hour, Jesse sat in the hotel foyer and meditatively watched the visitors come and go, but saw no sign of his quarry. Then he arose, put on his hat, and hunted out a stationary store, where for two cents he bought a bright red envelope. He then visited a ticket scalper's office, secured the owner's business card, and wrote a note on its back to Dodge offering him cheap transportation to any point that he might desire. Armed with this, he returned to the hotel, walked to the desk, glanced casually over a number of telegrams exposed in a rack, and when the clerk turned his back, placed the note addressed to Charles F. Dodge unobserved upon the counter. The office was a busy one. Guests were constantly depositing their keys and receiving their mail, and even as Jesse stood there watching developments, the clerk turned round, found the note, and promptly placed it in box number 420. The very simple scheme had worked, and quite unconsciously the clerk had indicated the number of the room occupied by Dodge. Jesse lost no time in ascending to the fourth floor, viewed room number 420, returned to the desk, told the clerk that he was dissatisfied with the room assigned him, and requested that he be given either room number 421, 423, or 425, one of which he stated he had occupied on a previous visit. After some discussion, the clerk allotted him room number 423, which was almost directly opposite that occupied by Dodge, and the detective at once took up his task of watching for the fugitive to appear. Within the hour, the door opened, and Dodge and a companion, who subsequently proved to be E. M. Bracken, alias Bradley, an agent employed by Howe and Hummel, left the room, went to the elevator, and descended to the dining room on the second floor. Jesse watched until they were safely ensconced at breakfast, and then returned to the fourth floor, where he tipped the chambermaid, told her that he had left his key at the office, and induced her to unlock the door of room number 420, which she did under the supposition that Jesse was the person who had left the chamber in Dodge's company. The contents of the room convinced Jesse that he had found Dodge, for he discovered there two grips bearing Dodge's name, as well as several letters on the table addressed to him. The detective returned to the hall and had a little talk with the maid. The old gentleman with you has been quite sick, she said. How is he today? He is some better, answered Jesse. Yes, he does look better today, she added, but he surely was powerful sick yesterday. Why, he hasn't been out of his room before for five or six days. This statement was corroborated by Dodge's physical appearance, for he looked haggard and worn. Jesse was now confident that he had found Dodge, in spite of the reports of the New Orleans police to the contrary, and he was also reasonably sure that the fugitive was too sick to leave the hotel immediately. He therefore telegraphed his superiors that he had discovered Dodge and that the latter was ill at the St. Charles Hotel. At three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesse received a wire from New York as follows. New Orleans Police Department claims party not there. Left for Mexico three weeks ago. Ascertain correct destination and wire at once. Jesse at once replied, no question as to identity and presence here at this time. He now took up the task of keeping his quarry under absolute surveillance day and night, which duty from that moment he continued for a period of nearly ten months. During the remainder of the afternoon and throughout the night, Dodge and Bracken remained in room number 420, and during the evening were visited by several strangers, including a plainclothes officer from the New Orleans police headquarters. Little Hummel, dining in Longacre Square in the glare of Broadway, was pressing some invisible button that transmitted the power of his influence even to the police government of a city 2,000 miles away. The following day, January 26th, at about 8.40 in the morning, Dodge and Bracken descended to the lobby. Bracken departed from the hotel, leaving Dodge to pay the bill at the cashier's window, and Jesse heard him order a cab for the 11.30 a.m. Sunset Limited on the Southern Pacific Railroad and direct that his baggage be removed from his room. Jesse did the same. 
In the meantime, Bracken returned and promptly at 11 a.m. left for the railroad station in a cab with Dodge. Jesse followed in another. As the two passed through the gates, the detective caught a glimpse of Dodge's ticket and saw that it had been issued by the Mexican National Railway. Retiring to the telegraph office in the station, he wired New York as follows. Bird flying, Sunset Limited. Destination not known. I am with him. He then hastily purchased a ticket to Houston, Texas, and boarded the train. Dodge's companion had bidden him goodbye as the engine started, and Jesse's task now became that of ferreting out Dodge's destination. After some difficulty, he managed to get a glimpse of the whole of the fugitive's ticket, and thus discovered that he was on his way to the city of Mexico via Eagle Pass, Texas, while from the Pullman conductor he learned that Dodge had secured sleeping car accommodation as far as San Antonio, Texas only. So far, all was well. He knew Dodge, but Dodge did not know him and later on in the afternoon he had the satisfaction of a long talk with his quarry in the observation car, where they amiably discussed together current events and argued politics with the same vehemence as if they had been commercial travelers thrown fortuitously into each other's company. Dodge, however, cleverly evaded any reference to his destination. When the train reached Morgan City, Louisiana at 3 p.m., which was the first stop, Jesse wired New York as follows. On Sunset Limited with Friend. He has transportation to the City of Mexico via Eagle Pass, where I am now journeying with him. Answer to Beaumont, Texas. Later in the afternoon, he sent an additional message from Lafayette, Louisiana. Have seen transportation of friend and am positive of destination. Dodge was occupying Section 3 of the sleeping car Capitola and, as became an invalid, retired early. At Beaumont, Jesse failed to receive any reply to his various messages, and when the train arrived at Houston, no word came from New York until it was almost the time of departure. Waiting until practically the last moment, Jesse hurried through the gates of the Union Station at Houston and bought a ticket to San Antonio. As he was leaving the ticket window, Night Chief of Police John Howard and two officers came hurrying up, inquiring anxiously for Mr. Jesse. The reinforcements had arrived. Outside on the track, the Sunset Limited was just getting underway. The first frantic puffs were being vomited from the funnel. Inside, Dodge was sleeping peacefully in his berth. Jesse, accompanied by Chief Howard, hurried up to the conductor, who was about to swing onto the steps of the sleeper, and ordered him to hold the train till the fugitive could be removed. After some argument, the conductor grumblingly complied, and Dodge was aroused from pleasant dreams of the Creole quarter to the cold reality of being dragged out of bed by a policeman. He was unceremoniously hustled out of the sleeping car into a carriage and taken to headquarters, where he admitted his identity and remarked, I know what I am wanted for, but I will never return to New York. In his grip was found the sum of $1,563.15, as well as numerous letters from the law firm of Howe and Hummel and a quantity of newspaper clippings relative to his case. Dodge pleaded with Chief Howard not to lock him up, urging that he was a sick man and offering a goodly sum if he might be taken to a hotel and guarded for the remainder of the night. But what went in New Orleans did not go in Houston, and the best that Dodge could get for himself was a cot in the ladies' detention room on the second floor of the jail. Early the following morning, Jesse visited police headquarters, and for the first time met George Ellis, chief of police of Houston, for whom he will always have a feeling of deep gratitude for his enthusiastic cooperation and loyalty in the many stirring events that followed. Dodge now received a telegram from New York, which was submitted to Jesse before reaching the prisoner, to the effect that Howe and Hummel were sending on an attorney to aid the fugitive in resisting extradition and informing him that they had employed Messrs. Hunt and Myers as attorneys to look out for his welfare. These last immediately jumped in medias res, and on the afternoon of the same day secured a writ of habeas corpus from Norman J. Kittrell, District Judge of Harris County, Texas, returnable the following morning. The next day, January 28th, Kittrell released Dodge from custody. Jesse had anticipated this and immediately swore out another warrant with the result that the prisoner was rearrested before he left the courtroom. Meantime, the Dodge interests retained another firm of lawyers, 
Messrs. Andrews and Ball, who on the following day secured a second writ of habeas corpus from Judge Ash. The result of the first engagement, thus being a draw, counsel on both sides agreed that this writ should not be returnable for six days. During this period, District Attorney Jerome employed Messrs. Baker Botts, Parker, and Garwood to represent him, and secured from Governor Odell at Albany a requisition on Governor Lanham of Texas for the extradition of the prisoner, which he entrusted to Detective Sergeant Herlihy of the New York Police. Herlihy reached Houston with the papers on the evening of January the 30th, and on the same train with him came Abraham Kaffenberg, a member of the law firm of Howe and Hummel, and a nephew of the latter. Likewise also came Bracken, still styling himself E. M. Bradley, and from now on Bracken was the inseparable companion, guide, philosopher, and friend of the unfortunate Dodge, whose continued existence upon this earth had become such a menace to the little lawyer in New York. Herlihy, accompanied by Judge Garwood, proceeded direct to Austin, where they found Dodge already represented by Messrs. Andrews and Ball, who, at the hearing before Governor Lanham, made a strong effort to induce that executive to refuse to honor the requisition of the governor of New York. This effort failed, and Governor Lanham issued his warrant, but Herlihy had no sooner returned to Houston for the purpose of taking possession of the prisoner than he was served with an injunction enjoining him, together with Chief of Police Ellis, from taking Dodge into custody, pending a hearing upon a new habeas corpus, which had been issued by Judge Waller T. Burns of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas. This new writ was returnable February 9th. After exhaustive but futile argument by the counsel for Dodge, Judge Burns remanded the prisoner to Herlihy's custody to be returned to the state of New York, but this decision had no sooner been rendered than an appeal was taken therefrom by Dodge's lawyers, and the prisoner released upon bail fixed at $20,000. During this period, Dodge was quartered under guard at the Rice Hotel in Houston, and the day following the argument, the $20,000 bail was put up in cash and Dodge released from custody. In the meantime, however, Jesse, knowing that no sum, however large, would deter Hummel from spiriting Dodge out of the country, had made his arrangements to secure a new extradition warrant from the governor of Texas, so that if the prisoner did succeed in getting beyond the southern district of the federal court of Texas, he could be seized and conveyed to New York. Of course, someone had to keep watch over Dodge while Jesse hurried to Austin to see the governor, and it was decided to leave Sergeant Herlihy reinforced by a number of local detectives for that purpose. But while the watchful Jesse was away, Bracken proceeded to get busy in the good old Howe and Hummel fashion. Lots of people that Herlihy had never seen before turned up and protested that he was the finest fellow they had ever met. And as Herlihy was, in fact, a good fellow, he made them welcome and dined and wined at their expense until he woke up in the Menger Hotel in San Antonio and inquired where he was. Jesse, meantime, had returned from Austin to discover that Dodge, with his companions, Kaffenberg and Bracken, had slipped out of Houston early on the morning of February 11th, after disposing of Herlihy and eluding the watchfulness of Herlihy's assistants. Hummel was leading, and by 10 o'clock the next morning, Dodge and his comrades were on board an English merchantman lying in the harbor of Galveston. Later in the same day, the Hummel interest chartered from the Southern Pacific Railroad for the sum of $3,000, the seagoing tug Hughes, to which Dodge was now transferred for the purpose of being conveyed to the port of Tampico in the Republic of Mexico. But here Hummel's wires became crossed with Jerome's, and unfortunately for the little lawyer, the persons from whom the tug had been leased turned out to be closely allied with the prosecution's interests with the result that the captain of the tug was instructed by his superiors under no consideration to put into any Mexican port, but on the contrary to delay his departure from the harbor of Galveston for a period of two days, and then to proceed only as far as Brownsville, Texas, where he should compel the debarkation of the fugitive. The captain, who was a good sport as well as a good officer, promptly threw himself into the park, and told Bracken and Kaffenberg that it was evident from the barometer that a severe storm was approaching, which must have had a sinister implication to these two unfortunate gentlemen, and that he could not think of putting to sea. 
Once the storm had blown over, the tug started out across the blue waters of the Gulf of Mexico. But now Bracken and Kaffenberg were informed for the first time that it was impossible to consider putting into any port of the Republic of Mexico, since to do so would cause international complications and compel the revocation of the captain's license. In desperation, the Hummel interests offered the captain $5,000 in cash to disregard his instructions and put into Tampico. But the worthy sea dog was adamant. It was probably worth $5,000 to him to see three gentry of this pattern so much put about. While Dodge and his accomplices were dallying in the harbor of Galveston, Jesse was taking advantage of his opportunity to proceed at once by railroad to Alice, Texas, which at that time was the furthermost southern point reached by any railway in the direction of Brownsville. On his arrival, he at once applied to Captain John R. Hughes, commanding Company D of the Texas Rangers, who received him with great joy and ordered a detachment of the Rangers to meet the tug at Point Isabella at the mouth of the Rio Grande River on the border of Mexico. In the meantime, Jesse started on a toilsome stage journey to Brownsville, across 170 miles of desert, which occupied two days and nights and necessitated his going without sleep for that period. During the trip, Jesse heard no word of English and had as his associates only Mexican cattlemen. Every 15 miles, a fresh relay of Broncos was hitched to the stage, and after a few moments' rest, the misery began again. Jesse had been hurrying toward Brownsville by stage, while Dodge, Kaffenberg, and Bracken were landing at Point Isabella, where they were kept under close surveillance by Sergeant Tom Ross of the Rangers. Thence, they took the train to Brownsville, registering at the Miller House under the assumed names of C.F. Doherty, A. Kuntzman, and E.M. Barker, all of Oklahoma. But although they knew it not, Sergeant Tom was at their elbow, and had Dodge attempted to cross the border into Mexico, he would instantly have been placed under arrest. As Brownsville was within the southern district of the Federal Court of Texas, Jesse decided not to arrest Dodge until he should actually attempt flight, and when Dodge and his companions on the following morning, February 15th, entered the stage, the same upon which Jesse had arrived, and started for Alice, Jesse and Tom Ross procured the best horses they could find and started after them, keeping just in sight of the stage. Dodge's intention in making this move was to take the Mexican International Railway at Alice and cross over to Mexico via Laredo. Jesse and Ross covered the 74 miles from Brownsville to Santa La Cruz Ranch by four in the afternoon, which was fairly strenuous work for a New York detective, and here found themselves so sore and exhausted from their ride that they were glad to hire a pair of horses and buggy with which to complete the journey to Alice. Luckily, they were able to get into telephonic communication with various ranch owners along the road and arranged to have fresh relays of horses supplied to them every 20 miles. And here also Jesse called up Captain Hughes at Alice and suggested that he substitute for the regular night clerk at the city hotel one of the privates of the rangers by the name of Harrod. Dodge and his companions arrived in Alice on February 17th and, as Jesse had anticipated, repaired at once to the city hotel, where, inasmuch as they were dry from the dust of their trip and depressed by lack of society, they entered at once into an enthusiastic and confidential friendship with the man behind the counter in the hotel office, sublimely ignorant that they were unfolding to a member of the Texas Rangers all their most secret intentions. Harrod was just as glad to see Dodge as Dodge apparently was to see Harrod and kindly offered to assist the fugitive to get into Mexico in any way the latter desired. Dodge, for his part, took advantage of his usefulness to the extent of requesting him to purchase them railroad tickets, the plan being to leave Alice the following morning for Monterey, Mexico. Three hours after the stage bearing Dodge and his party pulled up at the city hotel, Tom Ross and Jesse drove in behind a pair of fagged-out broncos at two in the morning. Jesse had had no sleep of any sort and no proper nourishment for five days, and had just strength enough left to drag himself up one flight of stairs and tumble into bed, from which he did not emerge for many hours. In the meantime, day broke, and Dodge, Kaffenberg, and Bracken, having breakfasted, drove comfortably down to the International Railway Station and settled themselves in the smoker, but they had no sooner given this direct evidence of their intention 
before Captain Hughes entered and placed Dodge under arrest. The latter's surprise may be appreciated when it is stated that from the time the three had left Houston, they had no idea that they were being followed, and believed that they had completely foiled Jesse and his assistants. While Jesse had been chasing Dodge across the desert, his lawyers had not been idle, and had secured at Austin another extradition warrant from Governor Lanham, who, on receiving news of the arrest, promptly instructed Captain Hughes by wire to assume charge of the prisoner and to deliver him into the hands of the New York officer to be conveyed to New York. There now began such a legal battle as the state of Texas had never known. Hummel had been forced into his last ditch and was fighting desperately for life. Through Kaffenberg he at once applied for a new writ of habeas corpus in Nueces County and engaged counsel at Corpus Christi to assist in fighting for the release of the prisoner. Precisely as Hummel had intended, Chief Wright of Nueces rode into Alice and demanded the prisoner from Captain Hughes. As Hummel had not intended, Captain Hughes refused to surrender the prisoner and told Chief Wright to go to... Well, he told him that he intended to obey his commander-in-chief, the governor of Texas. On February 20th, Hummel, through Kaffenberg, attempted to get another writ of habeas corpus in B County, and promptly the B chief came buzzing over and demanded Dodge, but to him Hughes replied even as he had spoken to Wright. Excitement in Alice had now reached such a pitch that Judge Burns of the federal court in Houston ordered United States Marshal John W. Van of Alice to assume charge of the prisoner. The indomitable Hughes, however, paid no more attention to the United States Marshal than he had to the local chiefs. But the situation was so delicate, and the clash of authority might so easily have resulted in bloodshed, that it was finally agreed by all parties that the best thing to do was to have the prisoner return to Houston in the joint custody of Captain Hughes of the Rangers and the United States Marshal. Jesse, through his counsel, in proper course, made application to forfeit Dodge's bond and remand him to jail. But the Hummel attorneys finally induced the court, on the plea that to confine Dodge in jail would be detrimental to his already badly impaired health, to permit the prisoner to go free on a greatly increased bond, nevertheless restricting his movements to Harris County, Texas. While Jesse had fought a winning battle up to this point, he was at the end of his resources so far as the extradition of the prisoner was concerned, for Dodge was now at liberty, pending the decisions upon the habeas corpus proceedings of the United States Circuit Court of Appeals at Fort Worth, and the United States Supreme Court at Washington. But his orders were to bring Dodge back to New York. Hence, with the aid of some new men sent him from the North, he commenced an even closer surveillance of the prisoner than ever before by both day and night. Meantime, Kaffenberg departed for New York, fleeing from the wrath of Judge Burns, who had issued a summons for him for contempt of the federal court, on the ground that he had induced Dodge to attempt to jump his bond. In place of the blustering Kaffenberg was sent another member of the famous law firm of Howe and Hummel, David May, an entirely different type of man. May was as mild as a day in June, as urbane as Kaffenberg had been insolent. He fluttered into Houston like a white dove of peace with the proverbial olive branch in his mouth. From now on, the tactics employed by the representatives of Hummel were conciliatory in the extreme. Mr. May, however, did not long remain in Houston, as it was apparent that there was nothing to be done by either side pending the action of the courts and in any event, Dodge was abundantly supplied with local counsel. The time had now come when Hummel must have begun to feel that the fates were against him, and that a 20-year term in state prison was a concrete possibility, even for him. In the meantime, Dodge and Bracken had taken up their headquarters at the Rice Hotel, in the most expensive suite of rooms in the house, a new scheme for getting the prisoner beyond the reach of the New York courts apparently having been concocted. Dodge was now indulged in every conceivable luxury and vice. He was plunged into every sort of excess. There was no debauchery which Bracken could supply that was not his, and their rapid method of existence was soon the talk of the county, and continued to be so for ten long months. There is more than one way to kill a cat, and more than one method of wiping out the only existing witness against a desperate man striving to escape the consequences of crime. Dodge's daily routine was somewhat as follows. He never slept at his own hotel, 
but arose in the morning between ten and eleven o'clock, when he was at once visited by Bracken and supplied with numerous drinks in lieu of the breakfast for which he never had any desire. At noon, the two would have luncheon with more drinks. In the afternoon, they would retire to the pool rooms and play the races, and when the races were over, they would then visit the faro banks and gamble until midnight or later. Later on, they would proceed to another resort on Louisiana Street, where Dodge really lived. Here his day may be said to have begun, and here he spent most of his money, frequently paying out as much as $50 a night for wine, and invariably ending in a beastly state of intoxication. It is quite probable that never in the history of debauchery has any one man ever been so indulged in excesses of every sort for the same period of time as Dodge was during the summer and fall of 1904. The fugitive never placed his foot on Mother Earth. If they were going only a block, Bracken called for a cab, and the two seemed to take a special delight in making Jesse, as Jerome's representative, spend as much money in cab hire as possible. The Houston Jehus never again experienced so profitable a time as they did during Dodge's wet season, and the life of dissipation was continued until from time to time the prisoner became so weak from its effects that he was forced to go under the care of a physician. A few days of abstinence always restored his vitality, and he would then start out upon another round of pleasure. During this period, Jesse maintained a close and vigilant personal espionage over the prisoner. For over ten months he slept less than four hours each day, his fatigue being increased by the constant apprehension of treachery among his own men, and the necessity of being ever on the alert to prevent some move on the part of the defense to spirit the prisoner away. During the summer attempts were repeatedly made to evade the vigilance of Jesse and his men, and several desperate dashes were frustrated by them, including one occasion when Brackett succeeded in rushing Dodge as far as Galveston, where they were forced to abandon their design. From time to time, Bracken would disappear from Houston for a week or ten days, stating on his return that he had been to New York, after which there was invariably some new move to get the prisoner away. Time and space prevent giving a detailed account of all the marches and countermarches that took place in this battle of wit against wit. In August 1904, Bracken made one of his periodical visits to New York, and when he returned, sought out Jesse and said, Blocker, you might as well be a good fellow and get yours while you can. I mean that Dodge is not going back to New York, even if it costs a million dollars to prevent it. A few days later, Bracken sent a gambler named Warner to Jesse, who offered the latter $3,500 to get lost long enough for the prisoner to slip over to Mexico. Acting upon the advice of his attorney, Jesse encouraged this attempt, under the belief that if he could get the Hummel forces in the position of having attempted to bribe him, the prisoner's bail could then be forfeited and Dodge himself taken into custody. Hummel became wary, however, and apparently abandoned, for the time, the idea of bribery. Later on, Bracken again disappeared. On his return, a marked change was noticeable in his demeanor, and Jesse observed that he was in constant consultation with Dodge, from which the detective drew the inference that some last desperate move was to be made towards the escape of the prisoner. On one occasion, Jesse saw Bracken showing Dodge a map and some drawings on paper, which so excited his suspicions that he followed the two with unremitting assiduity, and within a day or two was rewarded through Bracken's carelessness with an opportunity for going through the latter's coat pockets in the billiard room. Here he found a complete set of plans, worked out in every detail, for spiriting the prisoner from San Antonio into Mexico during the state fair. These plans were very elaborate, every item having been planned out from the purchase of tickets and passing of baggage through the customs, to hotel accommodation in the city of Mexico and Tampico, and steamship tickets from Tampico to Europe. The plan had been to secure permission from the court for Dodge to leave Houston long enough ostensibly to attend the fair at San Antonio, and to lose him during the excitement and crowded condition of the city at that time. It is, of course, needless to say that these plans were abandoned when Bracken discovered that Jesse had been forewarned. Almost immediately thereafter, the Circuit Court of Appeals at Fort Worth, Texas, decided one of the habeas corpus cases adversely to Dodge, but it still permitted him to retain his liberty pending the final determination of the questions involved by the Supreme Court in Washington. The Hummel forces were apparently losing hope, however, 
for early in October another attempt was made to bribe Jesse. Bracken entered his room one evening and informed him that he could get his own price if he would only be a good fellow, and even went so far as to exhibit a quantity of money which he stated was $25,000. The only result of this offer was to lead Jesse to redouble his precautions, for he argued that the situation must indeed be acute when such an offer could be deemed worthwhile. Thereafter, it was obvious that the revelry of Dodge and his companions was on the increase. Accordingly, Jesse added to his force of assistance. On December 2, 1904, Nathaniel Cohen, another member of the firm of Howe and Hummel, arrived at Houston, and the next day the Supreme Court at Washington decided the appeal in the habeas corpus against the prisoner, who was at once ordered by Judge Burns into the custody of United States Marshal William M. Hansen. Things looked black indeed for Dodge, and blacker still for Hummel. How the little attorney, eating his midday lunch 4,000 miles away at Pontine's restaurant on Franklin Street, must have trembled in his patent leather boots. His last emissary, Cohen, at once procured an assistant by the name of Brookman, and with him proceeded to Wharton County, Texas, where they secured a new writ of habeas corpus, and induced the local sheriff, one rich, to swear in a posse comitatus of 100 men, for the purpose of coming to Houston to take the prisoner by force of arms out of the hands of the United States Marshal. This was one of the most daring and desperate attempts made in recent years to frustrate the law. Jesse believes that the real object of this posse was to precipitate a fight between themselves and the federal authorities. It is not inconceivable that in such an event Dodge might either have escaped or been killed. The men composing the posse were of the most desperate character, and consisted largely of the so-called feud factions of Wharton County, known as the Woodpeckers and the Jaybirds. Jesse had been informed, on what he regards as reliable authority, that this move cost the Hummel forces $15,000, and that each member of the posse received $100 for his contemplated services in the rescue of the prisoner. But civil war, even on a small scale, cannot be indulged in without some inkling of the facts becoming known to the authorities and prior to the receipt of the mandate of the Supreme Court, Judge Burns ordered the prisoner removed to Galveston for safekeeping. Thus, the long, expensive, and arduous struggle came finally to an end, for Judge Burns, in due course, ordered that Charles F. Dodge should be conveyed to New York in the personal custody of the United States Marshal, and delivered by him to the New York authorities within the borders of that state. Such an order was, of course, exceedingly unusual, if not almost unheard of but it was rendered absolutely necessary by the powerful influence and resources, as well as the unscrupulous character of those interested in securing Dodge's disappearance. In order to thwart any plans for releasing the prisoner by violence or otherwise, and to prevent the delay through the invoking of legal technicalities, Hansen and Jesse decided to convey Dodge to New York by water. And on the 16th of December, the marshal and his five deputies boarded a Mallory Line steamer at Galveston and arrived in New York with their prisoner on the evening of December 23rd. Dodge reached New York a physical wreck. How he was induced to tell the whole truth after he had pleaded guilty to the charge against him is a story in itself. A complete reaction from his dissipation now occurred, and for days his life was despaired of. Jesse, too, was, as the expression is, all in and the only persons who were still able to appreciate the delights of New York were the stalwart Marshal and his boys, who for some time were objects of interest as they strolled along Broadway and drank deep and hearty in the cafes. To the assistants in the district attorney's office, they were heroes and were treated as such. How Dodge finally testified against Hummel on the witness stand has already been told. As they say downtown, if Jerome had never done anything else, he would have made good by locking up Abe Hummel. No one ever believed he would do it. But Jerome never would have locked up Hummel without Jesse. And, as Jesse says with a laugh, leaning back in his chair and taking a long pull on his cigar, I guess I would not do it again. No, I would not do it again for all the money you could give me. The wonder is that I came out of it alive. When the reader comes to think about it, he will probably agree with him. End of chapter 10. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 11 of True Stories of Crime from the District Attorney's Office by Arthur Cheney Train. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. A case of circumstantial evidence. In the town of Culiano, in the province of Solano in Italy, there dwelt a widow by the name of Torsielli, with her two sons, Vito and Antonio. The boys loved their mother devotedly, and were no less fond of each other, the height of their ambition being to earn enough money to support her in comfort, without need of working in her old age. As it was, she arose before light, made the fire, cooked their breakfast, and labored in and about the house all day until they returned from the fields. But she was getting old, and at last became bedridden and infirm. She could no longer cook the meals, and the boys had to shift for themselves. Moreover, instead of finding her standing at the door with a smile on her wrinkled face, welcoming them to supper on their return, the fire was always out, and their mother lay on her couch, no less glad to see them, to be sure, but no longer able to amuse them or minister to their comfort. Then the taxes were increased, and hard times came. By twos and threes the men of the village packed their bundles, bade goodbye to their friends and families, and left the town, some to seek work in other parts of Italy, but most of them to take the big iron steamships for America, where work was easy and money plentiful. Sadly, the boys watched their comrades depart. They would have liked to go, too, to seek their fortunes in this new land of promise, but they could not leave their mother. The following year, some of the men who had gone away to America returned in fine clothes and with full purses to tell of the wonderful country beyond the seas, where one could always earn his ten lira every day and do as he liked. Viva la liberta, they cried, pounding on the tables in the café. Come, comrades, we have plenty of money. Drink to the great country of America. Vito and Antonio listened with envy. One evening, the elder brother asked Antonio to come to walk with him. When they had gone a little way, he said suddenly, Tony, I think I shall go to this America. We need more money to make our mother comfortable. If we wait until she is dead, the money will be of no use. You can stay here, and when I have made a place for you and her, you shall bring her on the ship to the new country. Vito was five years older than Antonio, and his word had always been law to the younger brother. So, although he was sick at heart at the thought of being left behind, he said nothing against the project, but tried to make it easy for Vito with their mother. The old woman could not bear the thought of her firstborn leaving her, and declared, with tears running down her face, that she should never see him again, but at last she yielded to their persuasions and gave Vito her blessing. It would be only a little while before she and Tony would join him, and they would be happy ever after. Then Tony was left alone with his mother. Every day he arose at the first streak of dawn, prepared breakfast, cleaned the house, saw that his mother was comfortable, and then started off for the fields. A month went by, two months, three, a year, but no word came from Vito. Tony assured the poor old woman that they would certainly hear from him the next week or the next but cruel fear had taken possession of him. Something had happened to his brother. The years swept on. Their mother became more and more helpless. Antonio was obliged to hire a woman to care for her as a nurse for a small sum, but it was just enough to leave only a pittance for them to live on. Tony grew thin and haggard. Where could Vito be? Was he alive or dead? Next to his love for Nicoletta Lupero, it became the great passion of his life to learn what had become of Vito. He had known Nicoletta from a child, and their love had followed as naturally as summer follows spring. It had always been Tony and Nicoletta ever since he could remember. But she was growing up, and from a boy he had become a man. Yet how could he marry when he could hardly earn enough to support his mother and himself? They talked it over time and time again. If Vito would only return, or good times come, it might be possible. But meantime there was nothing to do but wait. Nicoletta blossomed into womanhood. Had she not been betrothed, she would have been called an old maid. Neither she nor Tony took any part in the village merrymakings. Why should they? He was thirty and she twenty-five. They might have been married ten years ago had not the elder brother gone away. Tony secretly feared that the time would never come when they would be man and wife, but he patiently labored on, earning his two lira, or at most two lira and a half, per day. Then a man returned from America just for the harvest to see his family. He said that Vito was alive. He had not seen him himself, but others had seen him, and he was rich. He told of the plentifulness of gold in America, 
where every one was comfortable and could lay up a fortune. He himself had saved over 5,000 lira in four years and owned a one-third interest in a fruit store. He was going to take his brother's family back with him, all of them. They would be rich, too, in a little while. A man was a fool to stay in Italy. Why did not Tony come back with him? He would get him a place on the railroad where one of his friends was Padron. Tony discussed it all with Nicoletta, and she talked with the man herself. Tony, she said at length, why do you not go? Here you are earning nothing. There you could save in a month enough to keep your mother in comfort for a year. You have to pay the nurse, and that takes a great deal. While you are here, it would cause talk if I came to live in your home to care for your mother. But if you go away, I can do so without comment, and it will cost nothing. Perhaps you will find Vito. If not, you will soon make enough to send for both your mother and me. You're a good girl, he answered, kissing her, but I could not shift the responsibility of my mother to your shoulders. Still, I will talk to Father Giuseppe about it. The priest thought well of the plan. He was a little excited over America himself, and agreed to break the matter to the mother. She begged Tony piteously not to go. He was her only surviving son. Vito was dead. Let him but wait a little while, and she would not be there to stand in his way. Then the priest added his personal assurance that it would be for the best, and the mother finally gave way. Tony was obliged to tear himself away by force from the arms of the old woman lying upon the bed, and her feeble sobs echoed in his ears as he trudged down the road with the scarf Nicoletta had worked about his neck, and a small bundle of his tools and most precious possessions on his shoulder. A couple of miles farther on came another harrowing parting with his betrothed, and from the top of the next rise beyond he could see Nicoletta, still standing at the crossroads, gazing pitifully after him. Thus many an Italian, for good or ill, has left the place of his birth for the mysterious land of the Golden West. The voyage was for Antonio an unalloyed agony of seasickness and homesickness, and when at last the great vessel steamed slowly up the North River, her band playing and the emigrants crowding eagerly to her sides, he had hardly spirit enough left to raise his eyes to the mountains of huge buildings, from whose craters the white smoke rose slowly and blew away in great wind-torn clouds. Yet he felt some of the awakening enthusiasm of his comrades, and when once his feet touched earth again, it was not long before he almost forgot his sufferings upon the ocean, in his feverish anxiety to lose no time in beginning to save the money which should reunite him to Nicoletta and his mother. As soon as the vessel had docked, a blustering Italian came among the emigrants and tagged a few dozen of them, including Antonio, with large blue labels, and then led them in a long, straggling line across the gangplank and marched them through the muddy streets to the railroad train. Here they huddled in a dirty car filled with smoke, and were whirled with frightful speed for hours through a flat and smiling country. The noise, the smoke, and the unaccustomed motion made Antonio ill again, and when the train stopped at Lambertville, New Jersey, the padrone had difficulty in rousing him from the animal-like stupor into which he had fallen. The Italians crowded together upon the platform, gazing helplessly at one another and at the padrone, who was cursing them for a lot of stupid fools, and bidding them to get upon a flat car that stood upon a siding. Antonio had to be pushed upon it by main force, but the journey this time was short, and in half an hour he found himself upon an embankment, where hundreds of Italians were laboring with pick and shovel in the broiling sun. Here he was also given a pick and told to go to work. Tony soon became accustomed to his new surroundings. Every night he and the rest were carried to Lambertville on flat cars, and in the morning were brought back to the embankment. The work was no harder than that to which he had been used, and he soon became himself again. Moreover, he found many of his old friends from Culiano working there. In the evenings, they walked through the streets of the town or sat under the trees playing Mora and Toco. His letters home were quite enthusiastic regarding the pleasant character of the life. To be sure, he could not write himself, but his old friend Antonio Strollo, who had lived at Valva, only a mile from Culiano, acted as his amanuensis. He was very fond of Strollo, who is a dashing fellow, very merry, and quite the beau of the colony, in his wonderful red socks and neckties of many colors. Strollo could read and write, and besides, he knew Antonio's mother and Nicoletta, and when Tony found himself unable to express his thoughts, Strollo helped him out. 
When the answers came, he read them to Tony and joined in the latter's pleasure. Tony himself soon became a favorite in Lambertville, for he was simple and gentle and full of goodwill for everybody. He was very good-looking, too, with his handsome Roman profile, snapping black eyes and black curly locks. Yet he was sad always, especially so as since his arrival in America he had made no progress toward finding Vito. From time to time he met other Italians who had been working elsewhere, who thought they had seen him or someone that looked like him. But inquiry always elicited the fact that their desire to give him encouragement was greater than the accuracy of their memories. Of course, Antonio Strollo, who had become Tony's inseparable friend, shared all his eagerness to find Vito. In fact, Tony had no thought that he did not confide to his friend, and it was really the latter who composed the love letters to Nicoletta and the affectionate epistles to the mother. Every month Tony divided what he earned into three parts. One of them he deposited in the savings bank. Another he invested in a money order, which was sent by Strollo to Nicoletta for the mother, and the last he kept for himself. It was astounding how fast one really could make money if one was industrious. Forty dollars a month sometimes. That made nearly seventy lira to send to Nicoletta. His bank account grew steadily, and he often saved something out of the money he allowed himself to live upon. Antonio Strollo, on the other hand, was lazy, and spent all his wages on chianti, neckties, waistcoats, and gambling. Sometimes he would do nothing for a whole month but loiter around the streets, smoking cigars and ogling the village girls. These last were afraid of him, and called him the daredevil. Tony worked on the embankment for three years, sending his money with a letter to Nicoletta every month. The mother still lived, and Nicoletta was giving up her own life to take care of her, but the old woman was very feeble, and no longer had any hope of seeing either of her sons again. Moreover, she was now so bedridden that it was useless to think of trying to move her, even if Tony had plenty of money. No, as soon as he was satisfied that Vito could not be found, and had saved enough money, he must return. How she begged him to return. As Strollo read him the girl's letters, Tony wept bitter tears, and Strollo wept likewise in sympathy. But no word came of Vito. Tony, anxious about his mother, despairing of ever finding his brother, pining for Nicoletta, and with three hundred dollars lying in the savings bank, decided to return to Italy but if only he could find Vito first. Then Antonio Strollo had an idea. Why not advertise, he suggested. He wondered that they had never thought of it before. They would put a notice in Il Progresso, the Italian paper in New York, and see what would come of it. Tony agreed that the idea was good, so Strollo wrote the notice offering a reward for news of Vito. Two months passed. Once more Tony gave up hope, and then, oh never to be forgotten day, a letter came from the post office from Vito. Tony threw his arms about Strollo and kissed him for joy. Vito was found at last. The letter, dated Yonkers, New York, told how Vito had by chance heard of Tony's notice and learned that he was in America. He himself, he said, had prospered and was a padrone, employing many workmen on the waterworks. He begged Tony for news of their mother. He confessed himself an ungrateful son never to have written, but he had married and had had children and had assumed that she was being cared for by his brother. Tony must forgive him and come to him at once. Oh, Dio, cried Tony, the tears in his eyes. Forgive him. Of course I will forgive him. Come, Antonio, let us write my dear brother a letter without delay and tell him that our mother is still alive. How should I like to see his wife and babies? So they prepared a long letter, which Strollo took to the post office himself and mailed. Tony went back to work with joy in his heart and whistled and sang all day long, and of course he wrote all about it to Nicoletta. He was only waiting for his month to be up before starting. Then he would go to Yonkers, make Vito a little visit, and return home to Italy. It would be easy enough after that for Vito to send them money if necessary to live upon. Several letters passed between the brothers, and at the end of the month, Tony drew out his money from the bank, received his wages in full, and prepared to leave Lambertville. Meanwhile, a letter had come from Nicoletta, telling of his mother's joy at learning that Vito was still alive. As Tony had doubts as to his ability to find his way to Yonkers, Strollo kindly offered to accompany him. Tony had made many friends during his three years' stay in Lambertville, 
and he promised to write to them and tell them about Vito and his family. So it was agreed that the letter should be sent to Sabato Gizzi, in whose house he had lived, and that Gizzi should read it to the others. The address was written carefully on a piece of paper and given to Tony. So early in the morning of August 16th, 1903, Tony and Strollo took the train for New York. It was a hot day, and once again the motion and speed made Tony feel ill, but the thought of seeing Vito buoyed him up, and by the time they had crossed the ferry, and had actually reached New York, he was very hungry. In his excitement, he had forgotten to eat any breakfast, and was now beginning to feel faint. But Strollo said it was a long way to Yonkers, and that they must not stop. For many hours they trudged the streets, without getting anywhere, and then Strollo said it was time to take the cars. Tony was very tired, and he had to climb many flights of stairs to the train. It carried them a long distance, past miles of tenement houses and vacant lots, and at last into a sort of country. Strollo said they should get out. It was very hot, and Tony was weak from weariness and lack of food. But his heart was light, and he followed Strollo steadily down the wilting road. After going about a mile, they crossed some fields near where people were playing a game at hitting little balls with sticks. It was astonishing how far they could strike the balls, entirely out of sight. "'Is this Yonkers?' asked Tony. "'It is near here,' answered Strollo. "'We're going by a short way.' They entered some thick woods and came out upon another field. Tony was now so faint that he begged his friend to stop. "'Can we not get some food?' he inquired. "'I can hardly walk.' "'There's a man in that field,' said Strollo. "'Go and ask him.' So Tony plodded over to the man who was digging mushrooms and asked him in broken English where they could get something to eat. The man told him that it was a long way. They would have to take the trolley to Yonkers. There was a restaurant there called the Promised Land, where one could get Italian dishes. He seemed to take a kindly interest in Tony and in Strollo, who had remained some distance behind, and Tony gave him a cigar, a cremo, the last one he had. Then Strollo led the way back into the woods. It was almost sunset, and the long, low beams slanting through the tree trunks made it hard to see. They went deeper and deeper into the woods. Presently, Strollo, who was leading the way, stopped and said, We are going in the wrong direction. We must turn around and go back. Tony turned. As he did so, Strollo drew a long knife and plunged it again and again through Tony's body. Strollo spent that night under an assumed name at the Mills Hotel in Bleecker Street. He had stabbed himself accidentally in the knee and also in the left hand in the fury of his attack, and when he arose in the morning the sheets were covered with blood. There was also blood on his shoes, which had been new, but he took his knife and scraped it off. He had experienced a strange sort of terrified exultation the night before, and in the early light, as he crept downstairs and out of the hotel, he could not have told whether he were more glad or afraid, for he had three hundred dollars in his pocket, more than he had ever seen at any one time before, as much as a man could save in two whole years. He would be a king now for a long time. He need not work. He could eat, drink, and play cards, and read some books he had heard about. As for finding him out, never. The police would not even know who Torsielli was to say nothing of who had killed him, for he had removed, as he thought, everything in Tony's pockets. There would be a dead man in the morgue, that was all. He could go back to Lambertville and say that he had left Tony with his brother at Yonkers, and that would be the end of it. First, though, he would buy some new clothes. It was very early, and the shops were hardly open but he found one place where he could buy a suit, another some underclothes, and a third a pair of shoes. The shoemaker, who was a thrifty man, asked Strollo what was the matter with the shoes that he had on, so Strollo craftily said they hurt his feet. Then he ate a hearty breakfast and bought a better cigar than he had ever smoked before. There was a bookstore nearby, and he purchased some books, Alto Amore, and Sua Maesta e Sua Moneta, the height of love, and his majesty and his money. He would read them on the train. He felt warm and comfortable now, and not afraid at all. By and by, he went back on the train to Lambertville and smoked and read all the way, contented as the tiger is contented, which has tracked down and slain a water buffalo. That same afternoon, about sunset, in a lonely part of Van Cortlandt Park, the mushroom digger stumbled over Torsielli's body lying face downward among the leaves. He recognized it as that of the man who had asked the way to something to eat and had given him a cigar. He ran from the sight, 
and pallid with fear notified the nearest police officer then things took the usual course the body was removed to the morgue an autopsy was performed and headquarters took charge of the case as the deceased was an italian detective sergeant petrosini was called in torsielli's pockets were empty save for the band of a cremo cigar in one waistcoat pocket and a tiny slip of paper in another on which was penciled sabato gizzi p o box two three nine lambertville new jersey whether this last was the name of the deceased the murderer or some one else no one knew headquarters said it was a blind case but petrosini shrugged his shoulders and bought a ticket to lambertville here he found sabato gizzi who expressed genuine horror at learning of tony's death and readily accompanied petrosini to new york where he identified the body as indeed that of torsielli he told petrosini that tony had left lambertville in the company of strollo on thursday august sixteenth this was saturday august eighteenth and less than thirty-six hours after the murder strollo reading alto amore and drinking in the saloon suspected nothing new york was seventy miles away too far for any harm to come but monday morning walking lazily down the street near the railroad station strollo found himself suddenly confronted by a heavily built man with a round moon-shaped face thickly covered with pockmarks strollo did not like the way the latter's gimlet-like eyes looked him over there was no time to turn and fly and besides strollo had no fear they might come and ask him questions and he might even admit almost all almost all and they could do nothing for no one had seen what he had done to tony in the wood so strollo returned petrosini's gaze unflinchingly are you antonio strollo asked the detective coming close to the murderer yes certainly i am antonio strollo replied the latter do you know antonio torsielli continued petrosini to be sure answered strollo i knew him well he added almost insolently why did you accompany him to new york inquired petrosini sharply strollo paled he had not known that the police were aware of the fact i had errands in the city i needed clothes said strollo he has been murdered said petrosini quietly will you come to new york to identify the body strollo hesitated why yes certainly i will go to new york then he added thinking that his words seemed insufficient i'm sorry if torsielli has been murdered for he was a friend of mine there was a wait of several hours before the train started for new york and strollo utilized it by giving petrosini a detailed account of his trip with torsielli he took his time about it and thought each statement over very carefully before he made it for he was a clever fellow this strollo he even went into the family history of torsielli and explained about the correspondence with the long-lost brother in which he acted as amanuensis for he had come to the conclusion that in the long run honesty up to a certain point would prove the best policy then he told the detective many things which the latter did not know or even suspect strollo's account of what had happened was briefly as follows he and tony had reached new york about twelve o'clock and had spent an hour or so in the neighborhood of mott street looking at the parade of san rocco then they had started for yonkers and gone as far as the terminal of the second avenue l it was about five o'clock in the afternoon they had got out and started to walk as they proceeded they suddenly had seen a man standing under a tree and torsielli had said to strollo that man standing under that tree looks like my brother strollo had replied you know i am not acquainted with your brother as they reached the tree the stranger had stepped forward and said to torsielli who are you who me my name is antonio torsielli had been the reply who are you i am vito torsielli had answered the stranger then the two had rushed into each other's arms and what did you do inquired petrosini as strollo naively concluded this extraordinary story me answered strollo innocently why there was nothing for me to do so i went back to new york petrosini said nothing but bided his time he had now several important bits of evidence by strollo's own account he had been with the deceased in the general locality of the murder shortly before it occurred he had given no adequate explanation of why he was in New York at all, and he was now fabricating a preposterous falsehood to show that he had left his victim before the homicide was committed. On the train, Petrosini began to tie up some of the loose ends. He noticed the wound on Strollo's hand and asked where it had been obtained. The suspect replied that he had received it at the hands of a drunken man in Mott Street. 
He even admitted having stayed at the Mills Hotel the same evening under an assumed name, and gave as an excuse that his own name was difficult for an American to pronounce and write. Later, this information led to the finding of the bloody bedclothes. He denied, however, having changed his clothes or purchased new ones, and this the detective was obliged to ferret out for himself, which he did by visiting or causing to be visited almost every Italian shop upon the east side. Thus, the incident of the shoes was brought to light. Strollo was at once taken to the morgue on reaching the city, and here for the first time his nerve failed him, for he could not bring himself to inspect the ghastly body of his victim. Look, cried Petrosini, is that the man? Yes, yes, answered the murderer, trembling like a leaf. That is he. You are not looking at him, said the detective. Why don't you look at him? Look at the body. I am looking at him, replied Strollo, averting his eyes. That is he, my, my friend, Antonio Torsielli. The prisoner was now taken to police headquarters and searched. Here, a letter was found in his hip pocket in his own handwriting, purporting to be from Antonio Torsielli to his brother Vito at Yonkers, but enclosed in an envelope addressed to Antonio at Lambertville. This envelope bore a red two-cent stamp and was inscribed, Antonio Torsielli, Box 470, Lambertville, New Jersey. The letter, as later translated in court by the interpreter, read as follows. Lambertville, July 30th, 1905. My dear brother, upon receipt of your news, I feel very happy to feel you are well, and the same I can assure you from me. Dear brother, you cannot believe the joy I feel after such a long time to know where you are. I have been looking for you for two years, and never had any news from you. I could not, as you wrote to me to, come to you because I had no money, and then I didn't know where to go because I have always been in the country. Know that what little money I have, I send it to mother, because if I don't help her, nobody will, as you never write to her. I believe not to abandon her, because she is our mother, and we don't want her cursed. So then, if you like to see me, you come and take me. You spoke to me about work thither, but I don't understand about that work which you say, and then what will I do, because here I have work. Therefore, if you think I can come and work with you, let me know, because I have the address." but if you want to do better, you come and take me. Dear brother, I remind you about our mother, because I don't earn enough money, which she is your mother also. Dear brother, I hope you did not forget our mother. Dear brother, let me know the names of your children, and I kiss them. Many regards to your wife and aunt. I beg you to write to me. Dear regards, your brother Antonio Torsielli. When you answer, send the answer to the address below, Antonio Strollo. Strollo made no attempt to explain the possession of this letter, which, if sent at all, would naturally have come into the possession of the addressee. And what was Vito's address at Yonkers? inquired Petrosini. 1570 Yonkers, answered Strollo. Is that the street number of a house or a post office number? asked the detective. Neither, said Strollo, just 1570 Yonkers. Thus the infamy of this villain was made manifest. He had invented out of his own brain the existence of Vito Torsielli in Yonkers, and had himself written the letters to Antonio which purported to come from him. He had used the simple fellow's love for his long-lost brother as the means to lure him to his destruction, and brutally murdered him for the sake of the few dollars which his innocent victim had worked so hard to earn to reunite him to his mother and his betrothed. The wounds in Strollo's hand and knee were found to correspond in shape and character with the thirty-six wounds in Torsielli's body, and the mushroom digger unhesitatingly identified him as the man in the company of the deceased upon the afternoon of the murder. It almost seemed like the finger of Providence indicating the assassin, when the last necessary piece of evidence in this extraordinary case was discovered. Petrosini had hurried to Lambertville immediately upon the discovery of the letter and visited the post office. A young lady named Miss Olive Phillips had been employed there as a clerk for twelve years, and had lately had charge of what are known as the call boxes, that is to say, of boxes to which no keys were issued, but for the contents of which the lessees have to ask at the delivery window. These are very inexpensive and in use generally by the Italian population of Lambertville who are accustomed to rent them in common, one box to three or four families. She had noticed Strollo when he had come for his mail on account of his flashy dress and debonair demeanor. Strollo's box, she said, was number 420. 
Petrosini showed her the envelope of the letter found in Strollo's pocket. The stamp indicated that it had been cancelled at Lambertville on July 26th. When she saw the envelope, she called Petrosini's attention to the fact that the stamp was a two-cent red stamp, and said to his surprise that she was able to identify the letter on that account as one mailed by Strollo on July 26th. As there is no local delivery in the town, she explained, drop letters, or letters mailed by residents to other residents, may be franked for one cent. Now, in the first place, no Italian in Lambertville except Strollo, so far as Miss Phillips could remember, had ever mailed a letter to another Italian in the same town. A frugal Italian, moreover, if he had done so, would have put on only the required amount of postage. On the 26th of July, Strollo had come to the post office and pushed this identical letter through the window, at the same time handing her two cents and asking her to put on a red stamp for him. She had been surprised at this, and at first thought of calling his attention to the fact that only a one-cent stamp was necessary, but she had refrained and put on the stamp. At the same time, she had noticed that it was addressed to Antonio Torcielli, Lambertville, New Jersey. Strollo had then taken the letter and slipped it into the drop, and she had cancelled the stamp, taking the opportunity to examine the letter a second time. A stranger coincidence could hardly be imagined, and this observing young lady from the country was thus able to supply the most important link in the chain against the murderer, and to demonstrate conclusively that the wretch had himself been mailing in Lambertville the letters purporting to come from the fictitious brother in Yonkers. Strollo was now placed in the house of detention as a witness, a course frequently pursued when it is desirable to prevent a suspect from knowing that he is accused. The case against him was practically complete, for it did not seem humanly possible that any jury would hesitate to convict him upon the evidence, but juries are loath to find anyone guilty of murder in the first degree upon purely circumstantial evidence, and this was the first purely circumstantial case in a long time. Inspector Price, therefore, conceived the idea of trapping Strollo into a confession by placing a detective in confinement with him under the guise of being a fellow prisoner. It was, of course, patent that Strollo was but a child mentally, but he was shrewd and sly, and if he denied his guilt, there was still a chance of his escape. Accordingly, a detective named Repetto was assigned to the disagreeable task of taking the part of an accused criminal. He was detailed to the House of Detention and remained there for five days, from September 8th to September 13th. Here, Repetto became acquainted with Strollo and the other prisoners, giving his name as Silvio del Sordo and his address as 272 Bowery. He played cards with them, read the papers aloud, and made himself generally agreeable. During this period, he frequently saw the defendant write and familiarized himself with his chirography. The scheme worked, and Repetto afterward received five letters from Strollo, sent after the latter had been removed from the house of detention to the tombs and indicted for the murder of Torsielli. The first, dated September 22nd, was merely to inform his supposed friend Silvio of the change in his residence, and to inquire the whereabouts of another prisoner named Philip. The second would be pathetic, were it not written by the defendant in the case. It carries with it the flavor of the Calabrian Hills. New York, October 17, 1905. Sir Silvio. I write and believe not to sicken you with my words, but it is enough that you are well in health. I take the liberty again, not having anyone else but you, and I believe to find a brother in you, not a friend. I ask you nothing, only if you have time to come and see me as soon as possible. I ask you this as a favor because I know and believe to find a true friend, as I want to ask you a certain thing at the cost of my life. I will not say any more. Bring me five cents of paper and envelopes to write letters, and when you come I will give you the money, nothing else. I am yours ever, servant and perfect friend, A. Strollo. The third letter from the perfect friend to his equally perfect friend is an extraordinary combination of ingenuity and ignorance. It contains the only suggestion of a defense, that of an alibi. New York, October 30th, 1905. Esteemed friend, with retard I answer in receiving yours. I was very, very glad. I believe all you told me, and I am grateful, and hope you will not betray me, because you know it will cost the life of a poor unfortunate. So do as you told me, keep things to ourselves. If you wish to help me, you will do me a great service, and if God helps me, you can dispose of my life. 
So I will have you called unexpected, saying that I did not know if you remembered. So if you are called, the first thing you must do is make believe to look at me, and then you say you remember of having seen me looking at the pictures in front of place where you work, and you asked me if I wanted my pictures taken, and I said no. If they ask at what time, say 5.20 or 5.30 p.m., and that you spoke with me for quite a while. If they ask how was he dressed, the coat was black, the shoes russet, the trousers with white stripes, which is the one I am now wearing. What tie? I don't remember. I only know that he was well dressed. The hat was brown. If they ask, did he have a mark on his hand, say no. He had a ring with a black stone. How many times did you see him? Say that after your work you were going around Mott Street, and you saw me again, and how it was eight o'clock or past eight, and you saw me with a handkerchief around my hand, and you said to me why I had my hand so. And he answered that someone struck him. I asked if it hurt much. He said he did not feel it. Did both of you go to drink? No. Where else did Strollo go? Strollo said he was going at the Bleecker Street Hotel to sleep. Did you see him again? No. Nothing else. If you want to help me, reflect well, but you don't need any more words from me. Say just what I have said, and I hope, with faith of a brother and not a friend, I am ever your friend, A. Strollo. It may, and probably will, appear to the reader that a clearer case of guilt could hardly be established, but the action of juries is always problematical, and this was a case composed entirely of circumstantial evidence. The jury would be obliged to find that no reasonable hypothesis consistent with the innocence of the accused could be formulated upon the evidence. Thus, even in the face of the facts proven against him, some freak juryman might still have said, but after all, how do you know that Strollo killed him? Some other fellow might have done it. Even the faking of a defense does not prove the defendant guilty, but merely that he fears conviction and is ready to resort to feigned testimony to secure his freedom. Many innocent men convict themselves in precisely this way. Accordingly, it was by no means with confidence that the people went to trial, but throughout this remarkable case it seemed as if it must have been preordained that Strollo should not escape punishment for his treacherous crime. No defense was possible, not even the partially prepared alibi was attempted, and the only thing that savored of a defense was the introduction of a letter alleged to have been received by the defendant while in the house of detention, and which, if genuine, would have apparently established that the crime had been perpetrated by the black hand. The offering of this letter was a curious and fatal blunder, for it was later proven by the people to be in Strollo's own handwriting. It was his last despairing effort to escape the consequences of his crime. Headed with a cross drawn in blood, it ran as follows. I swear upon this cross, which is the blood of my veins, Strollo is innocent. I swear upon the cross the revengeful black hand could save me. New York, October 12, 1905. Sir Strollo, knowing you only by name, eight days after that I leave, this letter will be sent to you. I leave at seven o'clock with the steamer Britain the harbor. Therefore, I leave betraying my oath that I have held for the last three years belonging to the black hand. I will leave three letters, one to you, one to the police officer Capri, and the other to the law, 300 Mulberry Street. All what I am saying I have sworn to before God. Therefore your innocence will be given you, first by God and then by the law, capturing the true murders. I am sure that they already captured the murderer of Torsielli, who lured you to come to New York was Giuseppe Rosa, who knew you for nearly two years and who comes from Lambertville, came among us and played you a trick. He is a Calabrese and has a mighty grudge. He and four others are averse to them announced the name of the man who stabbed you with the knife was Antonio Villa. He had to kill you, but you was fortunate. He is in jail for the present time, and I don't know for how long, but I know that he was arrested. Nothing else to say. I have done my duty in giving you all the information. 407 Second Street, Jersey. It is clear from the letter that Strollo had formed a vague plan for his defense, which should, in part, consist of the claim that he, as well as Torsielli, had been marked for death by the Black Hand, and that while both had been induced to come to New York, the plans of the assassins had, in his case, miscarried. The reader has already observed that purely for the purpose of securing his continued interest in the present narrative, the writer has, as it were, told his story backward, 
reserving as long as possible the fact that the finding of the beloved Vito was a pure fiction invented by the murderer. At the trial, however, the jury listened breathlessly, while bit by bit the whole pathetic story was painted before them like a mosaic picture. They heard first the story of the mushroom digger, there of the expedition of Petrosini to Lambertville, of the identification of Torsielli's body, of the elaborate fabrications of Strollo, and in due course of the tell-tale letter in the murderer's pocket. Gradually the true character of the defendant's crime came over them, and they turned from him in aversion. The natural climax in the evidence was Miss Phillips' extraordinary identification of the defendant sitting at the bar as the man who had mailed upon the 26th of July at the Lambertville post office the envelope purporting to come from Yonkers and containing the forged letter from the imaginary veto. Strollo remained almost to the last confident that he could never be convicted, but when his own letters in prison were introduced in evidence he turned ashen pale and stared fixedly at the judge. The jury deliberated but fifteen minutes, their functions consisting of but a single ballot, followed by a prayer for the wretched murderer's soul. Then they filed slowly back, and in the waning light of the summer afternoon, just one year after the murder, and at the precise hour at which Strollo had killed his victim, pronounced him guilty of murder in the first degree. In due course, his conviction was sustained by the Court of Appeals, and on March 11, 1908, he paid the penalty for his crime in the electric chair. End of chapter 11. Recording by Colleen McMahon. End of True Stories of Crime from the District Attorney's Office by Arthur Cheney Train.